Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining from all over the place. We have a lot of different time zones here. So maybe some folks are eating breakfast and others are on to their afternoon snack. Um, I'm a really relaxed presenter, so please feel free to type in the chat. I'll stop and check periodically for comments or, or questions. Um, and we also have some discussion at the end that will involve you guys quite a bit. So hopefully you came ready to share your, your wonderful thoughts. Um, there's a lot changing in agriculture right now. And we're going to focus on the end of the presentation. We're going to talk a lot about how we can kind of um, prepare for and respond to these changes and these uncertainties uh, through different partnerships that we can build and that you've already built in many cases. Um, I always think that it's a good idea when we're thinking about the future to understand the past. So we'll talk about some history as well. Um, my name is Bethany bogasel Kauter. I am trained as an epidemiologist and have been doing uh, different types of um, leadership development and research work with construction workers and farm workers for about the last 15 years. And right now I, I am based in Texas at the National Center for Farm Worker Health. Um, we have found that IDRC is a wonderful partner um, and have worked quite a bit with them over the last few years. And um, we are based in Texas, our office, but we work all over the country. And I love that so many of you are, are continuing to put where you're from. That's really great. All right. So like I mentioned, I want to start with a little bit of history about US Ag, and we'll see what, what you guys already know um, and what's new. So uh, this is a, some training, some information that I have really had um, a lot of fun doing. And I started out doing this training actually for farmers. So for small farmers and for larger farmers who employ farm workers. And it's been interesting and the response is different with every audience. So I started doing this training talking about the history of ag with farmers. And um, I ended up putting in this slide because so many of them had this idea. So many people in the U.S., especially white people, <laughs> have this sort of idea that there are these, you know, um, nuclear families, white men that are feeding America, and that that's how we've always done it, right? But you guys know that this is not not the case. There, it's not these small nuclear families that are doing all the farming. We know that it's changed a lot, and we'll talk about these in details. We've gone from, you know, before Europeans came to the Americas, a lot of different indigenous people were agriculturalists. That's kind of the first mistake that a lot of people make is they think that indigenous people here were all hunter gatherers, but we know they had lots of different agricultural systems, lots of different agricultural techniques that were being utilized. And then we really went through this kind of um, bizarre process really where we started farming after Europeans got here. Uh, mostly. Did somebody unmute because they have a question? No, I think they did it by mistake. So I'll, I'll keep an eye. I muted them. Okay. All right. Um, so we started with uh, indentured servants, right? They were Europeans that wanted to come to the U.S. And in order to get, a, um, to get on the ship to come here, they agreed to work um, usually on a, on a farm. And then we moved away from that and towards enslaving Africans as the primary source of farm labor because indentured servants were European, other settlers were European. They could run away and kind of blend in with the surrounding community. So um, people that held land and were farming for a profit ended up switching to enslaved Africans because if they ran away, they couldn't blend in as easily and it was easier to find them and bring them back and force them to work, sadly. So we had, you know, we had that system for a long time, uh, you know, for over 200 years. And then we'll talk about the more, the more modern system in a minute. So after we ended slavery, 
we kind of had a, a two two systems that were different on the west coast in california where most of you know most of the for profit farming was done that really relied on workers from east asia so from china from japan from the philippines that was the main form of agriculture in california um that stopped to a variety of reasons that I won't go into right now. Um, but after that stopped, the system that was present in the Southern United States, which is where a lot of the other for-profit farming happened, uh, that kind of became the dominant system throughout the country. And that was sharecropping. I'm really curious who here had ancestors that were sharecroppers because a lot of us do. Um, and sharecroppers were mostly um, at that time, and especially in the South, they were white and black families. And the system was really set up because it was envisioned by policymakers as a way for very poor families in the U.S. to slowly work their way up um, economically. And the idea was that eventually they could either be making a profit from their farming activities or they could eventually own land. So what we had was we had all these families that were working in agriculture, they didn't own land. And instead what they were doing was they were renting land, right? So they were, um, if they were very poor, they would give a portion of their crop to the landowner to sell. Or if they had become economically stable enough, then they would just pay the landowner for access to the land. Um, and so again, this whole idea was to move people up economically, but it really didn't work. Um, so what we had was in the 1930s, you know, most of the people farming in this country didn't own land. We had almost 2 million people doing sharecropping just in the South. And it became really disastrous because the contracts that landowners had with sharecroppers were usually only for a year. The effect of this was that people moved around a lot. And they ended up being really exploiting the land as much as they could because these people didn't have a lot of resources. They didn't have a lot of money. They only had one year, one, you know, one season really to make as much as they could. And so they, they had no long, it wasn't a long-term strategy on how to care for the land and make sure that they could sustainably farm. It was how much can I get out of this piece of land in a year? Um, and this was a major factor in why we had the Dust Bowls happen. So it was really kind of disastrous. And we moved away from that system with World War II. And the reason they did that, the reason landowners had a contract for a year, was surprisingly similar in a way to what how we see a lot of farm workers treated today. So the landowners didn't want sharecroppers getting together, they didn't want them organizing, they didn't want them getting attached to the land where they were, um, because they figured if they did that, they might demand more rights, they might demand greater, um, you know, greater access or greater benefits in relation to the land. And so they really wanted this very migratory workforce. And that has really had a lasting impact up until today. So politicians and legislators, they basically ended this whole sharecropping tenant system that we had that ran, you know, pretty steadily from the end of slavery until World War II. So they decided to end that because it just led to a lot of poverty, a lot of environmental issues. Now, the other thing going on that um, legislators have been working on in, since the United States became a country was having this issue with having too much food produced, especially since the 1800s. So, you know, this is still actually happens with dairy. So we have made a lot of food. We have very productive agricultural land in this country. We have really productive workers. We have really productive systems. And this leads to more food than, than we can eat. Um, and that causes some destabilization for farmers, right? Because they're, the price of the money that they can sell the food for goes down if we have too much of it. 
So what happened was this political shift when they moved away from sharecropping. Instead, farmers started receiving some government support to take their land out of production. So they're actually getting support from the government to stop farming. And this is when we saw, you know, there was really a concerted effort to move people into the cities in this era. Um, there was a lot of reasons why people were drawn to cities, even without the government support, right? They had, um, you know, entertainment, there was higher wages, life may have been perceived as more comfortable by some families, et cetera. So all of these factors kind of took a lot of our agricultural land out of production and pushed these smaller farmers and some of those nuclear families away from farming into, into urban work and urban life. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing for sharing that book. Yeah, that's I haven't read it, but I've heard it's really good. So what happened, this shift was pretty quick. It was really pretty abrupt. Um, World War II was really disruptive uh, to rural life and how, um, how agriculture worked in the US. So we had this, you know, kind of abrupt end to sharecropping. And this left a lot of those sharecropping families out of work. And then, so we had these people that didn't have land, they're out of work. These smaller farmers that did own land, they were already a really small group and they were disappearing fast because of these legislative changes to get farmers to take their land out of production. So what we had though is there was still farming happening, right? And we had all these things happening at once. So men were going away to war. We had sharecroppers that no longer could farm in the way that they had done for a really long time. And then we had small farmers moving in and taking jobs potentially away from these other groups of, of people who needed a job. So what happened is we had this massive shift of people out of agriculture and people that were still farming and owned land really needed workers. So that's when we started bringing in workers from Mexico with the Bracero program. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. And then interestingly, sugarcane, um, which was still mostly done by hand at that time, we brought those workers in from Jamaica, not from Mexico. So this change that happened in the 40s and 50s, it caused the big change that we see today. Right. And that moved it from we had people coming in um, with documentation on the Bracero program because of the huge demand for workers on farms. It wasn't entirely met by the Bracero program. So there was also, um, you know, unauthorized movement from Mexico and there was unauthorized workers working on farms as well. And then that really started to increase when the Bracero program ended in the 80s. So we had about, you know, about a little more than one in 10 farm workers in the, in the 80s and early 90s that were undocumented. And that's jumped up to half. And it's been about um, at about half of the farm labor force for a while now, for at least, you know, at least 10 or 15 years. And then the other shift that we've seen really recently is, you know, kind of slowly the Bracero program kind of morphed into the H-2A visa program. Um, and that hasn't been utilized that much in the early 2000s and even in the teens, but it's really gone up um, pretty dramatically more recently. So, you know, it went, it increased over 350% in a 10 year period. The other big change that we're seeing um, is just in the demographic makeup of who farm workers are. So we're seeing some increase in workers from Central America as opposed to Mexico. And the places where people come from in Mexico has changed a lot over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, so, you know, it's shifted kind of from Northern and Central Mexico to Southern Mexico. And Southern Mexico is home to a lot of indigenous communities. So we've seen that go up a lot. In the National Agricultural Workers Survey, um, it had estimated the proportion of farm workers who are indigenous to be around three or 5% for a long time. That's gone up to 10%. 
um, in our samples of farm workers that we've done around the country, um, you know, we surveyed about 5,000 farm workers over the last few years. And the estimates we have of, um, of the proportion of workers who are indigenous is closer to, to one in four. So around 25 or 30%. And it gets really high over 50% in some communities. So, and this is coming because of a lot of immigration from Chiapas, Oaxaca, Guerrero. And I think I have a map on the next slide. Yeah, so this is a map. You can see the darker states are the states that have um, more than 25% of the population that speaks an indigenous language. So let me summarize this up. So I think some of the key takeaways, you know, there tends to be a lot of, at least from what I hear, people get really concerned when the farm labor force changes. There can be like a lot of um, really legitimate concerns and things like that. But I think it's really important to understand that in the U.S. we've really always, always, always since the history of this country uh, started is that we've always had people who, you know, are economically disadvantaged and don't have access to land. Um, that's who works on our farms. And we've used various political and, and legislative tools to make sure that that's who is working on farms. So it's not... You know, people think that small farmers drive agriculture in the U.S., but we know that's not the case. It's really these larger farms that dominate and people that don't have access to land that work on them. So I think that can help us sort of prepare strategies. It can help us anticipate the different changes that we've had, because as soon as a group gains more political power or more social capital or things like that, that's when we can expect to see different people that will start coming in to agriculture, right? Unless we have a major shift in, in our agricultural industry. So I wanna pause here before we do our exercise real quick and just see who is seeing these shifts in their community. Are you seeing more H2A guest workers? Are you seeing more um, or fewer families come in? Are you seeing more or fewer indigenous families come into agriculture? and you can type in the chat. Yeah, so one respondent is seeing more H2A workers and fewer families. Yeah, Mingo, would you like to speak? I think you can come off of mute. I can unmute her. Okay. Um. Hi. Sorry, I wasn't sure. I didn't raise my. Oh, I raised my hand on accident. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. Um. So some Jose is seeing more H two A and political asylum families. So that's really interesting. Jose. Where are those political asylum families coming from? Which countries? And Ramona is saying also more H2A workers, fewer families. From Colombia and Venezuela, yeah. Where are you based, Jose? Which state? Okay, in Yakum. Yeah, that's really interesting that you guys are seeing asylum seekers from Venezuela. Are you guys noticing that they are working in agriculture before they get refugee status or is it after they get refugee status? And I'm gonna look at some of the other comments while y'all are answering. So um, Emily said that a lot of our H2A workers are also indigenous. Um, yeah, and in any given group, there are usually a handful um, that speak an indigenous language, especially if you ask about their 
parents. This is a really great point and something we've learned is that it's really a spectrum. It's a big range. You know, some folks are will um, speak an indigenous language as a child and then lose it later as an adult. Um, but certain concepts might still be better understood in their native language, even if they are pretty fluent in Spanish. And then other folks will speak both languages their whole life and pass it on to their children. Or some people, you know, it stopped with the parents. And it does seem to be if the community experienced more discrimination or more violence, um, you know, for being indigenous, then I think that can often cause the language to be lost more quickly. Um, interesting. So after they receive refugee status, they're working in agriculture. That's really interesting. Um, again, so fewer families. Yeah, lots of workers from Guatemala and Florida. Yeah, more Guatemalan youth. Yeah, this is great. This is a great point. I want to um, share a link with y'all towards the end of the chat because Recently, I facilitated a really interesting workshop with a lawyer who serves juveniles working in agriculture, and she was giving researchers a training on all these different immigration protections for juveniles, um, even if they can't get refugee status. There was a lot of other options, and that's been interesting. That's an interesting partner is the legal service providers, you know, whether it's um legal aid, farm worker legal aid, or there's lots of um, immigration legal clinics that would love to work with people who, who work with farm workers. Well, cool. You guys are such astute observers of your, of your community. Okay. So to summarize, you guys are already talking about this in the chat. So, you know, we have um, increasing employment of H2A workers, um, you might run into H2B in weird circumstances. Also, TN visa workers. I know a lot of you serve folks working in animal production, and you're probably just as a note so everyone knows, TN visa workers are kind of unique. The TN visa was created by the North American Free Trade Agreement, and that's an agreement between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And so folks who have higher education in certain specialized fields can get a TN visa to work in the US for three years. Um, they don't have to leave and come back, they can stay for three years. They can bring their families, they can bring their dependents. And um, I've seen a lot of TN visa workers on dairies and on hog farms. And they hire them, they hire agricultural engineers or veterinarians. And sometimes they end up doing specialized skills on those farms like insemination or or other things like that a lot of times they're just doing regular jobs um so it's a good one to look for um and then we talked about immigration from different indigenous communities in mexico and guatemala uh from central america like guatemala and el salvador like you guys are are saying um you know potentially fewer children especially fewer children migrating as gas prices have gotten so expensive. Um, you know, some industries are mechanizing and that might change the labor force. And then other, you know, I've heard a lot of producers just talking about climate change and changing crops, which may increase the need for workers or it may decrease the need for workers, just depending on what they're shifting to. Uh, that's so interesting, Norma, that a lot of students you meet have parents who are veterinarians. Yeah, this I think this is becoming a really big deal. Um, TN visa workers are actually, so they're not, they're not regulated by the Department of Labor. So they don't get their housing inspected like H-2A workers do. Um, and we've been trying to get data to figure out how many TN visa workers are on farms. So the State Department provides the number of T TN visa workers that are employed in different states, but we don't know what occupations they're in. So we're trying to, to work on them. Um, yeah. All right, more folks talking about Colombia and Venezuela and Guatemala. Okay. So other things we know are staying the same, right? Um, 
although there are some new protections down coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, we still have a lack to, of collective bargaining protections and other labor rights exclusions for many farm workers. Although I hope um, you all are familiar with the new regulation that starts in June, I believe, that actually does give H-2A workers uh, collective bargaining protections, along with some other things, like clarifying that third party folks can, can visit H-2A workers at their housing sites. Um, you know, ag is still very much tied to how our immigration system functions. That has not changed. Um, Spanish is still the dominant language spoken in most communities, although there's a lot of language diversity, like you all are mentioning. And then we still need, you know, our farm workers still need extra support in accessing local services and resources, including, you know, educational resources, healthcare resources, et cetera. So what can we do with all these changes? We're gonna do an exercise as a group, and this is a really big group. Normally we would do this in breakout sessions. So this is almost gonna be like a participatory train the trainer. I would love it if you all would take this information and then use it with your own teams whenever, whenever you have a problem <laughs> that needs to be solved in your team. We use this a lot internally. Um, We've been using it right now to figure out how to respond to, to bird flu, to H5N1, and, and plan our response around that. So this is a really fun, kind of easy exercise to do to stimulate new ideas on how to respond to these different changes. So we're going to use the chat. You can come off of mute if you would like to as well. You're welcome to do that. But we're going to use this exercise that's called critical uncertainties. And this is an exercise that is part of kind of a menu of other group exercises for liberating, it's from liberating structures is what it's called. And they have a ton of group activities that are really, really good. Because often we've been to brainstorming meetings and um, they fall a little flat or it's hard for people to generate new ideas or one person dominates the conversation. And so this, um, all of those exercises are really good for that. But we'll focus on, on this one right now. Um, and I want to, when we go through it, we'll put a special emphasis on, on partners. So first up, so we're gonna think of right now for your programs, like for migrant education program, for recruiting students, for serving students, et cetera. We wanna think about what are the factors that are outside um, of our control, you know, outside of the control of the migrant education program. And what are those factors that would impact us the most in our work in the future? So these are some ideas, right? Like um, if the ag industry continues to use a lot of H2A, visa workers or TN visa workers, um, you know, potentially maybe an increased use of bringing in spouses and children with H-2A or TN visa workers that could impact it. Um, if there's political changes, but yeah, you can put in the chat basically what you think, what you see coming up that could really impact your program that's outside of your control. And I'm going to switch my mode here so I can jot these down. Like a lot of you are mentioning an increase in um, political asylum seekers. And with those, I forgot to ask, with those folks who are asylum seekers or refugees, is that usually families or, or individuals? Okay. Yeah, so families, number of families would be a big one. What about, um, I'm gonna throw out another, a few other ideas here and you guys can tell me what you think. What about, um, I don't know how funding is for you guys, if funding is 
been very stable or if that is would impact you guys a lot. Okay, weather conditions, that's a good one. Technology. Could you, Marilu, could you expand on that? Like what, what types of changes in technology would impact you guys? Hello, uh, my name is Marilu from Washington State. Um, there, there has been new technology coming from, and I'm speaking of personal um, experience, uh, where my um, parents work, they work at a potato packaging factory and um, the company has like innovated this new technology that now stores um, the potatoes uh, using laser technology. So um, using new machinery. And um, I've also heard of uh, there's like a new machine that's able to pick apples. Uh, so there is less uh, manual labor needed for that. So um, just like new, new machinery inventions, I say. Okay, got it. So mostly you're you're talking about technology on farms, think jobs being mechanized, right? Um, so other folks are talking about housing availability. So I imagine this would be a big one. Like if housing is uh, cheap and available, then we might see more families. If it's very expensive, it might be more um, individual adults. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, program funding, transportation. Okay. So it seems like we're going to pick the top two, the top two factors here. It seems like the, you know, just the presence of families is the biggest one from folks. What's another one of these that y'all feel like is um, really big? Yeah, so actual percent who migrate. Housing. I did see housing quite a few times. So is that okay if we use these two housing and then um, families, if people are traveling as families or not, unaccompanied minors, not interested in education. Oh man, that's another, that's a hard one. Okay, let's do these two. Let's do housing and uh, families, and I'll show you how this will work. Um, yeah, language has always been a problem, right, with, with both health centers and the migrant education program. I'm just going to jot these down. Lack of child care. Okay. So how we're going to do this is we're going to think about four different scenarios using thinking about families and housing. And you could do this with any you know, any two factors basically. So over here, we're gonna have fewer families on one end. And then, oops, let me move my chat box. We'll have more families on the other end. Okay. And then the other way that we'll go is we'll have, um, we'll say like plentiful, affordable housing. Don't mind all my typos here. And then down here we'll have lack of affordable housing. So what this gives us now, 
now is when we think of some ideas for ways we could respond. So we have basically four different scenarios, right? So right here, we have a lot of affordable housing available, but we have people who working are working in farming and they're not with their families, right? So they don't have kids in the area. Here we have this where we don't have much housing and we have, um, you know, not many families still. Over here, we have a scenario in your in your community where there's lots of affordable housing and we're seeing more families. And then here, um, we would have not much affordable housing and a lot of families coming in. So basically what we wanna do is think about the way this would play out in your community. So for example, um, we don't have a lot of families coming in and there's not much affordable housing. It's like the worst case scenario right here, right? So what are some things that we would wanna do if that was the case in our community? How would we address that? Who are the partners that might be most important to work with? Um, and then same for all of these other ones. So let's start. Let's start with this best case scenario. We'll think of a few ideas here. So if you have great affordable housing in your community and you're seeing more families show up, what are some ways that you could act on that? Um, an increase enrollment in your community and who would you want to partner with in that case? Yeah, so you might wanna do like um, increased outreach at the school districts because more and more kids might be enrolling in the in schools, right? From these farm worker families. Okay, you could increase, it looks like also increase um, partnerships with the farmers or do outreach with farmers. Okay, um, work with the housing development program. That's great. Someone else said work with the health departments. How would you, how do you envision that going, working with the health departments? I'm curious. Mm, that's me. I am Paulina. I work with the CCIU Chester County Intermediate Unit in Pennsylvania. So I cried working with the health departments, because if you are going to have more families, uh, you're going to have more kids. So they have to be aware that they have to, the, they have services for immunizations, for the physicals for schools, eh, eh, child control, all, all of those things, because you are going to have more families. So that's going to be a good partnership with health departments. And if you have all this, the, the, if you have all the documentation ready, you go to school really fast. That is so insightful. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, that's really great. That would be a great opportunity to collaborate with the health departments. I'm wondering, are many of you in places where the health departments do outreach to farm workers? Let me check the chat, it's been busy. Um, so yes, yeah, um, let's see, Tonda said the partners who are best to work with would be growers and processors. They are solving their labor problems by hiring H-2A workers. And those farmers have to provide housing for H-2A. So this one, I'm gonna put this one in um, this box where there's fewer families and affordable housing. If we're talking about lots of H-2A workers coming in. but we'd want to partner with H2A employers. Um, and maybe even, there's lots of ways you could partner with them in that scenario if you have affordable housing, right? Because if there's ways for H2A workers to bring in their families and afford it, um, 
then that could be a way to kind of stabilize the workforce. And there's lots of ways, there's lots of benefits to producers in that kind of scenario. You know, I think employers are scared off by the by the option for H2A workers to bring in their families because they can't necessarily provide housing to H2A workers' families and they don't have to. But if there's other options to get those families into affordable housing, um, you know, that might reduce some of the concerns that H2A employers about having workers, you know, leave quickly um, and things like that. They might be a little more stable. And so that could be an interesting opportunity. And that would benefit, you know, the migrant education program and it would benefit those families. Someone said working with justice at work and that's a legal group, right? Um, someone else is talking about Intercare, which is a health center in Michigan that provides healthcare services. Um, housing authorities, yes, yeah, so housing, I put housing development groups in here, but yes, that would be, working with the housing authorities would also be great. And I'm gonna put in health centers too, wonderful. So which of these uh, would apply in other scenarios, do you guys think? Like if we have more families coming in and not much affordable housing, what would stay the same there and what would change? Like you might, if you have more families, I imagine you would still want to do outreach at school districts and work with health departments. But what are some things that might change if there's not much affordable housing in the area? We'll see, can you, do you mind explaining to me what you mean by the employment office, working with them? If you're able to. Yeah. When there isn't much affordable housing, families will double up or they move on to other employers who can offer housing. So that's a big one. Um, I wonder if there's ways, you know, especially if you know housing affordability is a big issue that, you know, the USDA has a lot of resources um, to create rural housing. And I wonder if working on those partnerships may be a long-term strategy because that would benefit the community, no matter how things shift, right? Oh, okay, Jose, so you're saying to, to do outreach, um, perhaps at the State Department of Labor offices where people are looking for, for work. Okay. Yeah, this someone made a comment about, you know, some farm workers and communities not necessarily seeking jobs at government agencies. I imagine that would vary a whole lot <laughs> um, based on the community and, and the workers. Some small towns are having housing issues and they work with contractors and incentivize them to build affordable housing. Yeah, that's another great one is there's cities and counties that have programs to build uh, affordable housing. So I will put that one down. So that would be more um, political work, but really important. There's some really interesting models actually going on for, you know, um, people, people who are unhoused. Um, and so like a really interesting model that's been going on 
here in Austin and now it's spread, I think, to other parts of Texas and Colorado. And that's they've been developing these these tiny home communities where there's uh, certain agreements that the residents make and they build these really beautiful, wonderful communities with really nice homes. And they're they're fairly small, but they've been able to get a lot of funding to do that work because they have such good outcomes. Um, so I wonder if there's models we could take from people that work with other populations that struggle with affordable housing and could apply them, you know, to farm workers. Oh, you're looking, so someone is looking, Joel is looking for funds to help build housing in Kansas. I would love to hear about that. And I know USDA actually told me recently that they've more recently started funding mixed use housing and they really like it. So, um, someone who was working on that project told me that they had in one community, I don't remember what it was, but they had funded a housing project that had a community and migrant health center on the bottom floor of the housing. And then the upper floors of the housing, you know, were housing units for uh, farm workers and other rural residents, which was really cool. And could, you know, could be a great space for migrant education to do outreach in as well, or even having educational services and things like that on that bottom floor of the mixed use housing. Um, all right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. This is really great. All right, let's talk about the hard one that many of you are experiencing now with a few, with a few minutes we have left. So fewer families coming in. Um, maybe we have available housing that's cheap. What are some ways that we could potentially attract more families to the area if we have affordable housing that's available. And I'm gonna drop my email in the chat now because um, I am really interested in talking about housing. So please send me a message if you wanna share and, and maybe I can connect some folks to USDA. So we could look at, you know, this was brought up before, like looking at if we have affordable housing, talking to employers about bringing in um, employees' families as well. This could be done also with anyone who is bringing in TN visa workers. Another one that I'll put on here is potentially working with community-based organizations, especially in areas where maybe your community previously had families coming from. So for example, let's say that just, just an off example that you're based in central Washington and 10 years ago, you had a lot of families coming from Southern California, let's say from Calexico, California. And if you now have a lot of affordable housing, then you could potentially work with organizations serving farm workers down there to let them know, right? You could let folks know who used to be on that migration pathway about those affordable housing opportunities. All right, and Alejandro said that dozens of homes are now available for farm workers in Southwest Kansas. A USDA grant funded 86 units at Hunter's Glen um, and in order to qualify at least one person in the household must be a farm labor worker. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah, and the issue with USDA housing becomes immigration status, I know, but there are options I know for mixed status families um, and other things and then, um, like is being mentioned, there's other mechanisms to get affordable housing through the city or the county or through philanthropy, you know, philanthropic organizations to potentially get around immigration status issues. So Norma mentioned higher wages and authorizing family members. Was this about uh, H-2A workers, Norma? OK, 
Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had asked, or I understood the question as, how could we bring in more workers if there was plenty of affordable housing? So if the wages were higher and maybe the living conditions, because I know that we've had in this area, we've had some issues where lots of, or some companies will bring in workers and the living conditions aren't the best and the wages aren't either. And I think there's, I mean, they've been looked at and things have gotten better, but um, they weren't getting the wages that they were promised and the conditions weren't great. And then also the man would come to do the work. So I'm thinking if, if the wages were higher, if they also approved family members um, with the visas, that would probably potentially entice them to come over. And of course, you know, word of mouth spreads, they could share with friends and then we would have an influx of more, more workers. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully more families. That's all. Those are great ideas. Um, this is really great. Is there any, I know we're almost at time. Are there any other thoughts? I'll drop this one down, but are there other thoughts on if you're seeing fewer families in your community, what are some other ways that you can respond to that? This is a tricky one. And I think that, you know, I think the future really lies in um, in some policy change, right? And policy change has influenced agriculture um, in, in many different ways. So some of that might be collaborating with employers and the DOL um, to get more visa worker families in. And then also what you guys are saying about so many asylum seekers is really interesting. Um, and that could rely on a lot of national state and local partnerships working. Like if you guys have a heads up about where refugees are being placed, um, that might be really beneficial to your program. I'm not sure if folks already have that kind of partnership where uh, social service organizations and other government agencies are made aware of when refugees or asylum seekers are coming to their community. Because that, I forget which administration, is it the office of, uh, I forget which office. I know it's in HHS, but I forget who is in charge of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but that would be a really good partner to get connected with. All right, and there's another comment. Yeah, the office of what is the uh, the second R stand for? It's Office of Refugee and Resettlement. Refugee and Resettlement. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so you know, I know there's different refugee agencies in different places and different counties and different states, and um, that would be interesting to partner with them. Liz said that they have a couple of different housing projects for farm workers in Palm Beach County, Florida, um, and they're available to anyone who works in the fields whether or not they're seasonal. That's, that's good to hear. I've seen some really nice farm worker housing in Florida. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna add this one. Are any of you working with a refugee agency right now? Okay, and Paulina, where are you based? Which state? I am in Pennsylvania. So in Philadelphia, we work with Hayas and with nationalities and with Bethany. And I know that migrant aid in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County, also they work with uh, many refugee agencies because in Lancaster County, there is a lot of refugees. It's very interesting. 
Yeah, and that would change the language needs a lot. I don't know how far in advance school districts are notified of that, of when they might have students um, from refugee families. Well, this was so, this was good. I'm wondering if anyone has any closing questions. This was a really great exercise. I think that the link did get put in the chat to this, like the whole explanation um, for this activity, but you, you know, you really could mix it up for your area. Like if you're seeing, if there's some other critical piece that's happening, maybe employers aren't as collaborative. So you can think through uh, different scenarios with that or um, really any other, you know, any other factor and it can really help people brainstorm different ideas that you hadn't thought of before, or different partners to work with. All right, I'm looking at the chat, make sure I didn't miss anything. Wonderful. I hope to hear from some of you soon about your housing projects that sound so interesting. And thank you so much for sharing your wonderful thoughts and ideas and your insights.